I do want to thank you for being here today and just welcome you to, to worship and service here at Olive Branch this morning. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, our time together today. I, I do want to just share with you just some, some prayer requests uh, that have been mentioned to me. Uh, Miss Jackie Skipper, we want to continue to remember her uh, in prayers and her health needs. Uh, Todd Darby, uh, continue just to remember him in prayer. He's still uh, seeing doctors and, and working through uh, his health needs right there, uh, but uh, still need to remember him in prayer. Gerald Johnson had a surgery this week, he's doing well, and uh, but continue to pray for him. Uh, Ms. Perry May uh, also uh, been in the hospital this week, and uh, but is at home. But so need to continue to remember her and uh, Eddie in our prayers. And also uh, Wayne Carrier was in the hospital this week. He's at home, and uh, but continue uh, to remember him in prayer. Those are uh, some of the the ones that have been mentioned uh, to me this morning. We want to especially remember uh, as we uh, come to the Lord in prayer. If you, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. If you'll open them up to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to begin reading with verse 24 this morning and read through 27. And we'll come back and look at these verses as we study them together in our, in our morning message. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Let's bow together as we go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we do come this morning to just thank you for the privilege of another day and the blessings of another week. And Lord, you've granted us the opportunity to gather together as your people, and we are so grateful for that. And not only just to gather together today, but to be able to pray for one another and encourage each other. Lord, we, we pray especially for those that have needs and for the request of prayer that have been given to us by several. And Lord, we pray for, for each of these today and for their needs. We thank you for uh, taking care of Wayne this week. And we thank, are thankful that he is at home and ask that you continue to provide healing for his body. We thank you for God in Gerald through surgery this week and, and for his recovery process now. We pray uh, for that. And Lord, we do lift Miss Paramay up to you and, and Lord, just the issues she's dealt with over the last few weeks and especially this week having been in the hospital. We pray for her and, and for Eddie as he cares for her and just ask for your blessings to be upon them. Thank you for them so much. And Lord, we do lift Todd up to you and we continue to pray for the needs that he has. And just pray that, uh, Lord, you'll continue to uh, guide and direct the doctors and, and just leading them in the right way to bring him back to health and, and, and back into our presence. And we do pray for Miss Jackie today and for the health needs that she has. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, you've answered prayers for us in the past. And we pray for present prayers to be answered on her behalf that she might uh, be better. 
uh, physically than what she's been and things she's dealt with. We thank you again for all of those that you've just answered prayers for us for this week. Lord, there are many others that are on our personal prayer list that haven't been mentioned this morning, but we lift those up individually and unspoken things that are close to the hearts of your people this morning that probably if asked they wouldn't have mentioned them, but they're there. And Lord, we know that you know what those things are and your people can express those needs to you as well. And we pray for all of those kinds of requests. Again, we thank you for the opportunity as we come to the end of the service this morning to share together around the Lord's table and to focus on what the Lord's Supper means and is all about. And we pray that you will make that a special time of our service also. Thank you again for the privilege of being in your house gathered together with your people to be able to hold your word, read it and study it and allow the Holy Spirit to interpret it to us. And that's what we ask happens today as our worship continues. Bless us as we sing these songs in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you will open your Bibles today to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to be studying together this morning those verses 24 through 27. We continue our series of messages that we've called Reflections, looking at some of the character traits that should be in our lives as believers. And this morning we're going to be talking about discipline or self-control. And I want to speak to you on this subject. The title of the message this morning is Living for the Approval of One. Living for the Approval of One. Of one. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, Paul is going to help us understand how to do that and what that looks like. I like, uh, I like stories. I like uh, to tell stories. I, uh, I like listening to stories when I was coming up. And I, I guess maybe one of the reasons for that is because we had a good storyteller in our house. Now, that wasn't my daddy. I want you to know that was my mama. And uh, she could tell a good story. She can still tell a good story. She can read a good story. Now, I just, I like stories. We read uh, to our grandchildren. Uh, I read to our children when they were coming up, and uh, I just like stories. This week, I, I read some stories to some of my grandchildren, and we've got some books Peggy just ordered for the summer, and I know boys don't like to read during the summer, but we got, you know, a crowd of grandboys that we have to help a little bit with that, but we do do a little bit of reading. One of the, one of the story books that I, stories I really like is, is one that uh, Max Licato wrote. And the book is, is, is real short and simple. It's called You're Special. And it's the story uh, of a group of wooden people. Uh, they were called Wemmicks. And they were wooden people. And they were all carved by the same wood carver. And they all lived in the same village. The wood carver lived in a, in a house way up on top of the hill. And all of the Wemmicks, the wooden people, they lived in the village down below. And they were all different. Some of them had uh, big noses and some of them had uh, big eyes and some had small eyes. And some of them were tall and some were short and some wore hats and some wore coats. And they all were just busy every day in the streets of the little city. And they were all doing basically the same thing. You know what they were doing? They were all, they all had been given boxes of golden star stickers and gray dot stickers. Now for all of the Wemmicks that lived in the village who could jump high and run fast, they would, they would get gold star stickers stuck on their wooden bodies. Now for those Wemmicks that couldn't jump as high or made mistakes would oftentimes be given gray dot stickers. 
And uh, some women uh, really did enjoy getting a, gray, a, a, a gold star sticker. It made them feel so good on the inside. You know what they did? They would go out the next day and see if they could do something good enough that another woman would give them a gold star sticker. But some women, like Pontanello, he wasn't able to jump as high as the other women were. And sometimes when he did try, he would fall. And uh, the other Wemmicks would give him a gray dot sticker. And sometimes when he fell, he would scratch the wood on his wooden body. And, and they would give him a gray dot sticker for that. And Pontianillo got so many gray dot stickers that he really didn't like to go outside much anymore. And when he did go outside, he hung around all of the folks who had the gray dot stickers. He seemed to feel more at home with them. One day something really amazing happened. Poncinello discovered an interesting wooden person in his village. Her name was Lucia. And Lucia had no dots at all. She didn't have any gold star dots on her wooden body. She didn't have any gray dots on her wooden body. She didn't have any dots at all. And all of the people in the village really, really admired Lucia. Some of them, because she didn't have any dots, thought she needed some gold star dots. And so they would try to put a gold star dot on Lucia, but it wouldn't stick. It would just fall off to the ground. And some of them didn't like Lucia because she didn't have any dots. And so they would try to put a gray dot sticker on Lucia. But when they did, the same thing happened. It, they, it, they just fell off to the ground. Poncinello said to Lucia one day, that's what I want to be like. I don't want anybody's marks on me. How do you do it? She said, I just visit Eli every day. He said, Eli, who is Eli? Oh, she said, Eli is the wood carver who lives in the house way up on the hill. Well, how does he do it? Well, why don't you go up there and find out for yourself? And with that, Lucia skipped away. And Poncinello decided that he would see for himself. And so he made his way along a very narrow pathway all the way up to the house on the top of the hill. He walked into the wood shop and he heard a deep and strong voice say, Poncinello? And he looked and there was the tall bearded woodmaker. You know my name? He said, Sure I do, Poncinello. I made you. And with that, Eli picked Poncinello up and set him on his workbench and said, hmm, as he looked him over, I see you have some dots. In fact, a lot of dots. Oh, I didn't mean to, he said. I didn't mean to get them. I tried to jump as high as others. I tried to run as fast, but when I did, I seemed to fall and scratch myself. Oh, Eli said, you don't have to explain to me what uh, the other women think don't matter to me. It doesn't? No, Eli said. What matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. Pacinello just laughed. Me, special. I can't jump high. I can't run fast. I can't sing pretty. I can't do all those other things. And then Eli said, but you're special to me because I made you. And I love you. How, Pacinello said, does Lucina keep the stickers from sticking on her? Eli said softly, because she's decided that what I think is more important than what all the other women think. You see, the stickers don't stick unless you let them. What? 
Yeah, they don't stick, Eli said, unless they matter. They only stick if they matter. And if what I think matters more than what they think, the stickers don't stick. I don't know if I understand, Ponchinello said, as Eli picked him up and set him back down on the floor off his workbench. You will in time, but you've got to promise me that you'll come to see me every day and that you won't miss a day and that you'll listen to what I have to say so that you'll understand that you are special to me because I made you and I don't make mistakes. With that, Ponchinello walked off and out of the woodcrafter's shop. And as he did, he thought to himself, nobody's ever looked at me like he did. And nobody's ever spoken to me like he did. I really think he means it. And about that time, a gray dot fell to the ground. What made the difference in Ponchinello's life? Ponchinello was reaching a point where the one who made him and what he thought mattered more than anybody else around him. And Paul is pushing us in that direction in this passage that we're going to study today. The question really comes at the start of the message today is simply this, and that is who are we really living to please? I mean, you really need to stop and think about that. Who are we really living to please? Who, who, who do we really want to honor today with the way we live our lives on an everyday basis? And Paul tells us that we ought to live for the approval of one. And that one he addresses as God. The one who we run for in this spiritual race. He, he uses that terminology in the passage today of a, of a race that's being run. And, and all of us are in that race if we are God's children. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments and what all of that means. He also at the end of the passage in verse 27 talked about, I don't, I don't fight beating the air. It's a fight. You ever thought about that? Our spiritual life, it, it, it is a race. It is a race that we run. And it's not a short distance race. It's a long distance race. It's a, it's a marathon that we are in. And in order to, to, to make it to the finish line in this spiritual marathon, we got to be disciplined. We have to have self-control. I had a marathon runner tell me one time, hey, you really aren't running against other people. You're running against the distance. Now, I thought about that a lot. You aren't really running against another person. You're running against the distance. You're, you, 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 you pace yourself because of the distance that you know you have. And you've trained yourself to understand that distance and how your body responds to it. And, and, and living the Christian life is the same way. It's, it's about the distance, folks. Sometimes people get started well, but they don't run well, and they certainly don't finish well. God wants us not only to start well, He wants us to run well, and He also wants us to finish well. And it also is not only a spiritual race, it's a spiritual fight. We're in a fight, and we have an enemy that is against us. We, we have an enemy that, is, that, that, that comes against us every single day. And, and you can see it everywhere in the world in which we live, and we experience it in our own spiritual lives. And what Paul is saying to us is that self-control, discipline, spiritual discipline and self-control is what allows us to live for the approval of one. You notice in verse 27 he says, But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. And the word subjection means control. I, I, I bring things under control. I discipline myself. I have self-control as I run this spiritual race for God. Now what does that mean? What does that look like? To be disciplined or self-controlled. To live for the approval of one. And that one being God. Now I want to suggest three things in this passage that, 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 that will help us understand living the, the self-controlled or the disciplined life. And I, and I would say that if probably anything our world is lacking, it is self-control and discipline. But notice what it looks like. Number one, 
This disciplined lifestyle, this self-controlled life that lives for the approval of one, it, it involves, first of all, a participation. And the word is key, participation. Paul, in verse 24, is talking about involvement in a race. And, and notice, notice the verse again. He says, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And there are two things about this part of the message that I want you to remember this morning. Participation in the race involves two things. It means, number one, that you are personally involved in the race. You notice it says, all those who run. So he's focused on individuals. He's focused on people who are involved in the race. It is possible for a person to have dual citizenship. Did you know that? That is possible. Sometimes an ambassador and his family will be serving for the United States in another country and they'll have a child that'll be born in the country in which they are serving and oftentimes that child has the potential of being both a citizen of the country in which they were born and also a citizen of this country because of the citizenship of the father. A dual citizenship. I don't know how often that happens, but what I can tell you this morning is that every one of us in this room today who know Jesus Christ as personal Savior are living a dual citizenship. The Bible says that not only are we physically born into the world in which we live, I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud that I live in the United States of America. I pledge my flag with great honor and stand to it. But I want to tell you, I'm also equally and maybe even more proud of the fact that my name's been written down in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. That I'm saved, that I'm a child of God. And so I've got a dual citizenship going on here. I'm living down here. But if you understand your Bible, your Bible teaches that you also are attached to something that is up there. Paul talked about how we are seated in the heavenless. And so if the only way I live my life is the focus of down here, guess what? It's going to be lived off. You see, it's a personal race. And, and, and here's how it gets started. This personal race gets started with a salvation relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it gets started. And that's why in the church we make a great deal about salvation and we encourage people to be saved and to come to Jesus Christ because look, if you haven't been saved, guess what? You're not in the race we're talking about this morning. It's a personal race. But I want you to notice that not only is it a personal race, it is a public race. It's a public race. You'll notice that he calls it that in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a what? In a race. Now if you've got runners in a race, you've got runners, but what else do you have? You got spectators, don't you? At every football game I've ever been to, you've got athletes on the field, but you've got fans also in the stands. And what's happening on the field is being watched by those who are in the stands. Guess what? You and I are in a race for God this morning, and you know where the, where the stands are? You know where the stadium is? The stadium is the world. The stadium is that world out there that, that you lived in and I lived in this week. It's that world that we'll go into when we leave this building this morning. And what Paul is saying is that we need to understand if we're Christians that we're in a great participation with the Father and we're running a race and others are watching us run that race. Just like fans watch their team play on the field, the world is watching God's team play on the field of life. And parents, I'm telling you, children are watching. And, and grandparents, I'm telling you, grandchildren are watching. And, and, and neighbors, I'm telling you, neighbors are watching. People are watching us. It is a personal race. We get in the race by being saved, but it is a public race. And that's why Paul wants us to understand you need to run this race by the approval of one. So, so it involves a participation. You got to be in the race. But it also involves a passion. It involves a passion in verses uh, 25 and 26. 
You notice he says in verse 25, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore he says, I run, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Paul says, I'm running to win the prize. I'm after the prize. I don't know about y'all, but I don't like to lose at anything. Anybody in here like to lose? Man, I don't like to lose at nothing. I don't. In fact, I'm, you, you, know, you just really don't know how competitive I really am. I'm so competitive that when, and this hadn't been too long ago, when Kayla was into horses and I was younger and we'd be gathering field, a, a, a hay up out of the field. Not round rolls sitting on an air conditioning tractor now. Square bales and me and her. And she just big enough to drive the truck. But I trained her how to drive the truck. And I remember I came one day, a guy I'd never had done business with, and I told him I wanted 500 bales of hay. And, and he said, all right, I got it for you. And he called me and said, I'm going to start cutting. And, and, uh, and uh, I pulled up, and he started bailing, and I started loading. It is just the two of us. He said, you got help coming? I said, no, this is it. You see it. This is it. And, and, uh, and she knew how to drive. And so I'd just go from one side of the trailer to the other, throwing it up off the ground. I got enough on there, and then I'd get up and stack, and she'd slow it down a little bit, and I'd stack it back off. I'd go. You know what, you know what I'd do from time to time? I'd time my own self to see if I could beat my time to how many bales I'd put on the thing the time before. That's how competitive. There wasn't nobody in the field to compete with. Just compete with yourself. I, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty competitive. I, I don't want to lose at anything. Paul, I think, was the same way. He wanted to win the race. He didn't just want to, he didn't just want to run the race. He, he just wasn't in it to run it. He, he wanted to win it. Well, 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 what does it take to win it, folks? What does it take to win it? I, we want to win it. I want you to win it. I want you to win the prize. And hey, the good thing is, in a football contest, it can't but one team win, right? I mean, in fact, they got it now where there's no ties anymore. You know, you got overtime and you got overtime rules. If it goes past two overtime, you're, they're changing the rules, making it tougher because somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose. But I got good news for you this morning. Every one of us in the house can run to win. Every one of us can. No, no, nobody's going to lose out in this race. That is not unless you don't run the race like God wants you to, unless you don't run for the approval of the one that it really counts. We all can win. But, but how does that happen? How, how do we win? And I, I want to give you three words this morning. Number one is with a desire. You know, if you, if you want to win, you've got to have a desire to win. Now, that's what I think Paul means when, in the latter part of verse 24 when he said, hey, run in such a way that you may what? You may obtain it, that you can win the prize. Run, desire it. And, and, and I've, I've, I believe this with all my heart. And, you know, some folks may not agree, but I, I believe it. Hey, look, we, we do exactly what we desire to do. Can I just tell you that? We do exactly, look, if folks want to come to church, guess what? They can come. They have plenty of churches. They can come. They just don't desire to come if they don't come. If, if people want to read the Bible, they can read the Bible. We got more Bibles in print and more Bible in digital form and more Bible out there than we ever had in, a, in, in, in the history of the world. If you want to serve God, you can. The, the, the issue is you got to have a desire to do that. A desire to run. A desire to not just get in the race, but a desire to run the race. And a desire to win the race for God. But not only a desire, but a discipline. Notice Paul says in verse 25, he says, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. They're disciplined. You have to discipline yourself. There are spiritual disciplines that need to take place in a Christian's life on a daily basis. You need to spend time with not the maker, but the redeemer. Amen? Now, listening to what he has to say. 
listening to his word to you. And how, how do you do that? I'll tell you how you do it. You do it by finding yourself a quiet spot and opening up this book right here. That's how you do it and getting along with God and letting him speak to you out of his word and then you talk to him back in prayer. It's called Bible study in prayer. It's called quiet time, whatever you want to call it. Hey, it's just called getting in the presence of the Redeemer. And letting him speak to you so that what he says to you means more to you than what anybody else says. But it takes discipline to do that. Michael Phelps, I guess, is one of the most decorated gold medalists of all times. He had 28 medals to his career. It's still a record today. He's won more medals than any other Olympian ever. He's won more individual medals than any other Olympian ever. He, he won more gold medals than any other Olympian ever. But it came at a price. I was looking back this week and, 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 and just looking at his schedule. You realize Michael Phelps swam 50 miles every week in training for the Olympics. 50 miles. Every week, he worked out twice a day. He worked out six to seven hours every day, six days a week. And what did he do for, for a medal? And the most expensive medal that Michael Phelps won was when he won with the London Games. That medal was worth $700. And guess what all those metals will do? They will tarnish. They will change colors on you. You've got to polish them and work on them to keep them shiny because they are tarnished, because they are perishable. They are fading away. And the comparison is, is that we ought to want to discipline ourselves because, hey, we're running for something bigger and better than anything you can ever find in this world. Something that will not perish away. But it takes discipline. It takes discipline. It takes direction. It takes making sure you're running in the right direction. Paul said, I don't, I don't, I don't like a fighter. I don't beat against the air. You see, uh, you can run, but the question is, are you running in the right direction? You can fight, but the question are, question is, are you fighting the right opponent? Paul said, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Principalities and powers and rulers and high places. We are in a fight, but it is a spiritual one. And so we need to make sure we're running in the right direction. Now, I'm going to say this, and it may, it may seem arrogant, it may seem uh, narrow, and all of those kinds of things that our world would put on it, but I just believe it with all my heart. If you are running your life for Jesus Christ, you're wasting it. You're wasting it. If, if you aren't interested in the will of God, interested in the work of God, I don't care how much fame and fortune you get, you're going to waste your life away. And that's what Paul said. We need to run for the approval of one. What does that involve? It involves participation, getting in the race, publicly running that race. It involves passion, a desire, a discipline, a, a, a running in the right direction. And then finally, it involves a precaution. In verse 27, he gives us a precaution. No, notice what he said. He said, I discipline my body. And I bring it under subjection, you notice verse 27, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should what? Become a castaway, the King James says. I, I just get cast away. I just cast over to the other side. Or I am disqualified. He talks about two things. The requirement, what's the requirement? Discipline. I discipline my body. That's the requirement. And the reason? So that I won't be disqualified. So that I won't be cast aside in the race. And that's so important. You know, I love stories. I love reading stories. I read a lot and I store stories back and put them in, uh, in files so that I can go back and maybe even years from now pull those stories out and use them as an illustration in a message. Sometime back, you know, I, I tucked away that story about the Kentucky Derby winner of this year, Medina Spirit. 
Bob Baffert and how that little horse didn't sell but for a thousand dollars down at Ocala which meant only one person bid on him nobody saw any potential in him and how he wound up in Bob Baffert's barn and how he made it to the Kentucky Derby and how he won but you know what that story's tainted now that story's tainted I can take it out of my files now because it's tainted because Bob Bafford can't run at Churchill Downs any of his horses right now and, and, and other racetracks followed suit with that because hey, he, didn't, he didn't follow the rules or somebody in his crew didn't follow the rules and a drug got used and disqualification came. You see, you see what I'm saying? So, so the story of this year's Kentucky Derby is tainted. Well, I, I don't want the story of my life to get tainted. And the way you don't do that is you've you got to stay disciplined. That's what Paul's saying. You've got to keep the bigger good in mind and the fact that, yeah, you're running a race and you're running it right here, but, hey, it's got greater complication, uh, uh, implications than just right here in the world in which we live. We don't want to miss out on running the best we can because we're running not for the approval of everybody that's around us, but for the approval of of the one that's above us. Cotton Fitzsimmons was coach of the Atlanta Hawks for a number of years. He was, he was coach at a time when they weren't doing very well. In fact, they, they were on a long losing streak. Didn't seem to be able to win a game. And they were playing the Boston Celtics. And it was at that time when the Celtics were the Celtics and they were playing them. And Cotton Fitzsimmons was known for his motivational speeches and how he could really fire a team up. And, and so he, uh, he got his team together and he told them, he said, I, I know that we've been having difficulties and we're on a losing streak and I know we're playing the Boston Celtics. And I know we got them on their own home court. And he went on in his speech, but he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I, I want you to hit that court tonight. And I don't want you to think about the fact that we're on a losing streak. I want you to pretend that we're on the longest winning streak Atlanta's ever had. And he said, when you hit that court tonight, I don't want you to think that you're playing the Boston Celtics. He said, I just want you to pretend like we're just playing any other team, not necessarily the Boston Celtics. And he said, when you hit the court tonight, I don't want you to think about this just another game in the season. He said, I want you to pretend that it's a championship game and you're, you're, you're playing for the championship of the season. Man, he had them fired up and they hit the basketball court. And at halftime, they were being blown away by the Bolton Celtics. No way they're going to come back. Man, he was furious. He was stomping his foot. It, it, it was not motivation now. It was more frustration and maybe a little anger coming out. And when he finished his halftime speech, he said, Now you get out there on the court and redeem yourself. One of the old boys, when they headed out of the locker room, slapped Cotton Fitzsimmons on the back and said, Hey, coach, don't be so upset. Just pretend we won. <laughs> well, I want you to know this morning that life is too short and too valuable to pretend. We cannot pretend. We must not pretend. And that's what Paul is saying in this passage. It's how he challenges us in this scripture. Let's don't pretend we're winning. We can win. We are on the winning side. Our Savior is Redeemer, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's defeated our enemy. We can win. We don't have to be defeated. We can win, and we need to run in that manner. But let me show you something quickly that's so important. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. And I want you to look at this chapter because it talks about the fruit of the what? The Spirit. I want you to look at verse 22. 
Galatians 5 and verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. And it's the same word that Paul used back in 1 Corinthians 9 when he said they're temperate in verse 26. They're temperate in all this. the same word. But, but watch this. Where does it come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, in and of yourself, in and of myself this morning, I don't have the ability to discipline myself or be as self-controlled as I should. But as a Christian, I have a force on the inside that enables me to live life that way and to live for the approval of one. And I'll tell you, that last phrase in that verse really caught my attention. Against such, there's no law. Did you know you can't legislate kindness? You can't legislate goodness, love, joy. You can't legislate any of this. You can't make people be kind. You can't make people be self-controlled or any of these things. You know why? Because these things come from within where resides the Holy Spirit of God. But with God at work in us, we can be these kinds of people and we can run the race to win. Would you bow together with me? In a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to have our, our invitation hymn that we always sing. Just give people an opportunity to respond to the Word of God, the Gospel. And I'll be down front to help any that have decisions this morning that God may have put on your heart. So I want to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to stand and sing this hymn, and then we'll close our service go into the Lord's table. Father, thank you for the challenge and encouraging words that you allowed the Apostle Paul to pen under the inspiration of your spirit that would challenge us and encourage us as we run our individual races for you. And Lord, I pray that every person listening to me today is in the race. But if there are those this morning who haven't Join this race by being saved. I pray that, Father, there'll be people who will do that today and allow us to help them. Lord, help us who've made that decision and who are publicly in this race to run faithfully for you that we may win the prize at the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is 187, hymn 187, Just As I Am. Would you turn to that and would you stand together with me as we sing this hymn this morning? And if there is a public decision or a commitment that you have or something that I can pray with you about today, I want to encourage you to come at this time as we sing our hymn of invitation. Let's sing together this great, great song one of these little cups that has our, our juice and our bread. If you'll, if you'll just lift your hand, Dalton will, will bring it to you if you didn't get one when you came in. Everybody, one right there, okay? Make sure everybody has one. I want to I want to read a passage to us today, and as we just read this passage, I want us to share together in uh, taking the elements of the Lord's Supper, the bread and, and, and the Jews. It was Passover when Jesus instituted this supper. And so from Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 12, let me just read with you some of this, read to you some of this passage. And as we come to certain portions in it, I want us to just share together in the Lord's table. In verse 12, it says, On the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, 
The teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared and make ready for us. I found verse 15 interesting this week. Jesus tells these disciples where to go. He tells them what to do. And notice Verse 15 says, He will show you a large upper room. And, and what is it? It's furnished and it's prepared. It's ready. This cup and piece of bread may not seem like much in the physical eye, but it represents eternity in the spiritual eye. Because it represents what Jesus did in preparing this for us. So he institutes the supper, verse 22. And as they were eating, <clears throat> Jesus took bread. So I want you to just go ahead and, and peel off that peeling and, and go ahead and, and take your piece of bread out. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. And he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then it says he took the cup, and I want you to just unpeel the wrapper from the juice. He took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And so I want us to just pause and give thanks. Andy, would you lead us in that? Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're free to celebrate this moment as believing Christians in your body and in your blood. Just like our Sunday school lesson today talks about those poor Christians or faithful Christians that Smyrna. You know that the Jews there were accusing them, the unbelieving Jews were accusing them of being countable that they were talking about eating the body and drinking the blood. Father, we're so thankful that we have the freedom to exercise celebrating your body and your blood. And it's in your name we pray. Before we drink this cup, Jesus gave an explanation in verse 24 when he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. We have a new covenant. The old covenant was under the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, this covenant is under the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. And Jesus went on to say, Assuredly I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The reason we should live for the approval of one, the elements of this supper remind us of that. They remind us of the one who gave his life for us, who shed his blood for us. So why should I live for the approval of one? All of the motivation I need is right here in the bread and in the cup. All of the motivation I need to run to the end is right there. And so Jesus said in verse 26, or the text says in verse 26, that when they had sung a hymn, that they went out to the Mount of Olives. And I want to ask you to join us in just singing a line of a great hymn, Blessed Be the Tithe. Would you, would you lead us in that? Let's stand together.